Okay, this is lesson 55, part B, and we're still on monetary policy. And we're gonna have a look at an idea which is called the output gap. Now the output gap, demand pull inflation, and cost push inflation, all of these things must just become part of your economics. Right, the output gap, first of all. Well, ideally, you probably want the output gap to be zero in an economy. And what does that mean? Well, that means that as you increase AS curve here, so here it moves from AS to AS dash to AS double dash, that's probably moved out because of supply side economics. At the same rate, we also want to increase aggregate demand. So increase AD to AD dash, move to NY dash, Please note on here that the price level stays the same. And if you can remember an earlier, an earlier lecture that I gave on the Institute of Directors, their big, big thing was to increase the underlying trend rate of growth, which is the AS curve, and then it allows policymakers, either through monetary policy or fiscal policy, both of which are demand side policies, to increase AD at the same rate. So we always want to try and keep the output gap to zero and the monetary policy committee also want to try and think well will the output gap be positive in the future okay if the upper gap is positive in the future what does that mean a positive output gap it probably means well it will mean that you're going to get demand pull inflation demand pull inflation as i previously said is too much demand chasing too few goods and what it means on here sorry price level real GDP is that aggregate demand has got out of control. There's more and more demand in the economy. We can't produce enough goods for the economy. So therefore we end up with demand pull inflation and you don't want to have demand pull inflation. You don't want to have inflation because if here, let's just say here, the inflation rate is maybe 3%, whereas up here, the inflation, it looks as if it could be about 9% then your goods are going to be more expensive when you try to sell them abroad. So therefore you're going to sell less exports abroad. Your exporters aren't going to be very happy. It may mean that interest rates have to go up in the future. So you don't really want inflation. So it's really bad economic management if you end up with demand pull inflation. Okay. What you want to try and do, as I originally said, was to get the aggregate demand curve rising in line with the aggregate supply curve. Now, in your textbooks, you'll often come across this diagram here. It's got time going on the bottom here, and it's got GDP going on here. Now, this is the underlying trend rate of growth, which really says that every single year, our economy should get bigger and bigger and bigger. The Institute of Directors believe that they can grow the economy at 3% per year, Whereas right now it's probably, we think it's probably growing at about 1.5%. So if you have better investment, that's going to increase more, more quickly. Lesson 51, increasing the LRAS curve. Right, now here if actual GDP is greater than potential GDP, right, so actual GDP is greater than potential GDP, then we've got a positive output gap and that is a sign of inflation. Actual GDP is what I should say there is greater than potential GDP. If, however, actual GDP is less than potential GDP, that is when you have a negative output gap. So right down here, I've drawn a very small little diagram down here where you've got a negative output gap. So here, that is actual GDP down there. This is potential GDP here. And between here and here is the negative output gap. You don't want one of those, and if you do, then you just want to try and increase AD, and you want to try and increase AD at least to here, because we're going to get economic growth, more jobs, more taxation, revenue, and everything else. Okay, the last thing I want to do today is cost push inflation. Cost push inflation can arise for all sorts of reasons. Wages go up, oil prices go up, commodities go up. And one of the big fears in the world right now is that we're going to end up with cost push inflation primarily because China and India are growing so quickly, so they're using up the world's resources very, very quickly. China's buying up the world's resources, therefore the price of all these commodities is going to go up. And there's loads of economists who say that we're going to end up with more and more cost push inflation. So there's different ways of defeating demand pull inflation, and there's also different ways of defeating cost push inflation. But cost push inflation is pretty serious because what happens is, the AS curve 
we'll move inwards so we end up with higher inflation if we start here that was inflation that's national income down here we then move to there and finally we're going to move to there okay so we don't want to get inflation again cost push inflation demand pull inflation positive output gap negative output gap less okay so this is once again about the monetary policy committee uh, before we even start, one of the main things about the Monetary Policy Committee is the main objective is to control inflation, right? That's the number one objective, or it has been in the past. More recently, because of the financial problems that have been occurring, actually one of the main objectives has been that they should be increasing growth. And the reason why we want growth so much is because the national debt is so large, the government must get more tax returns back and if we get more tax returns back, that will help to pay off some of the national debt. And actually, if we get a bit of inflation, if we get inflation of, say, 5%, which we had in the year 2011, then in real terms, the national debt will also fall by 5%. So in a sense, originally, it was always that inflation was the primary objective. And the reasons why it's good to have low inflation, as I've described earlier, is uh, when you're trying to sell your goods abroad, if, if your inflation rate is 2% and Germany's, <gasps> Germany's is, say, 5%, then your exports become more competitive. But also, it just sort of price stability or an inflation rate of 2%, that just creates better conditions, better conditions for businesses, and therefore, they're more likely to invest. Okay, so what I'm going to look at now is what are the factors that influence the Monetary Policy Committee when setting interest rates? Now, uh, there are lots of different things. One of them, which we've just done previously, a couple of minutes ago, is that the output gap. If the output gap is, say, zero, then that's a good sign. But if they think it will be positive in the future, then they raise interest rates now so that demand will fall slightly in the future, so therefore we don't get a positive output gap. Because if we get a positive output gap, what's going to happen is there's going to be demand for inflation. Also, house prices. Now, right now, for instance, in the year 2014, house prices are shooting up, and house prices, we think, are rising by about 10%. Between 1997 and the year 2007, house prices went pretty crazy, and in some areas, they, they increased three times over. So if house prices are shooting up, that is a sign that people are becoming wealthier, and if people become wealthier, so therefore they'll spend more money, and once again, you may end up with demand for inflation. They'll also have a look at the exchange rates. Now, recently what's happened in the UK is that the UK exchange rate, or recently, in fact, it's gone up slightly, but since 2008, at one stage, it had fallen by 25%. One of the problems with that is, as our inflation rate falls, obviously we all become poorer, but import prices come up. Import prices, higher import prices, means higher cost push inflation. So if import prices rise, that's going to add to inflation. Now, there's a big argument about this because we want low exchange rates because we want to sell more exports. But the problem of a low exchange rate is that we're going to get higher cost push inflation. And also, the government's going to have a look at fiscal policy. Now, this is a rare time in UK, in UK, in UK economic policy whereby we've got fiscal policy working with monetary policy. And right now, the government is decreasing G. And if you decrease G, remember the multiple accelerator, lesson 54, the multiple accelerator is going to kick in and that's going to lead to a fall in aggregate demand. And that fall in aggregate demand is going to create a negative output gap. So maybe then we can have lower interest rates because the government's going to be spending less money. If they think, sorry, I've got that one twice, the output gap again. Another thing they'll also have a look at is, put it down here, is the money supply. Now, this is the first time we've looked at the money supply, but basically the money supply is is how much money is going around the economy and that tends to happen from banks so banks lend out loads and loads of money then it's likely that the money supply is, in is increasing quite rapidly uh, the other thing about the money supply right now is that the government's also been used quantitative easing which you probably read about in the press so the government by printing money that will also increase the money supply and if the money supply is going up then that is likely to increase inflation However, between 1997 and the year 2007, we always had price stability. 
But the reason why we had price stability, that means an inflation rate of 2%. But the reason why we had price stability was because house prices and share prices were not included in the definition of inflation. So therefore, our inflation was always at roughly 2%. So everyone said that the government, sorry, the Monetary Policy Committee was doing a remarkable job in controlling inflation. But inflation, because inflation was, was in fact at 2%. But there were reasons for this is because the, the definition of inflation did not include house prices, which I've just said almost trebled in price in some parts of the UK economy, and the stock market was going haywire. Now, therefore, we didn't really see that inflation was coming. Added to this, the Chinese were producing loads and loads of goods. So we were getting loads and loads of cheap fridges, cheap goods coming into the UK economy, and that also helped to reduce inflation. So how successful was the Bank of England? Well, the, the Bank of England has come under a lot of criticism because obviously we were then faced with the credit crunch and they didn't really see the crisis coming. Uh, so therefore we, so therefore people say, well, they didn't see the, the credit crunch coming, therefore they are guilty and what they really should have done is to raise interest rates to quieten down the bubble. But one of the things that was really crazy was, was that house prices and the stock market were not included in the rate of inflation. Well, surely the Bank of England should have, should have seen that. So I'm just pausing here now and then because I ran a campaign down in London in the year 2006 and in 2008, whereby I was pretty convinced that the, 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 banking, the banking system was lending out too much money because why was it the house prices were, were shooting up? And it was pretty obvious to me, and I'm not trying to be a know-it-all af afterwards, it was pretty obvious to me that the banking system was out of control, right? You can't have house prices trebling in three years. That is going to have consequences, and that will have consequences in, in, in terms of inflation. But how well have they done since 2008? Okay, well, I think actually they've done pretty well since then because the economy was in a really, really bad way in 2008. And they pretty quickly got interest rates down to 0.5%, which is pretty much unheard of. Bankers tend to be quite conservative individuals. So for them to do that, I think was actually quite a, quite a, a remarkable thing really to happen. Mark Carney, the current governor of the Bank of England, I think he's quite radical in terms of what he wants. But he's, he's saying to have a policy of, we're going to have a low interest rates now for a long period of time, so therefore businesses are more likely to invest, which is, which is a good thing. Obviously, it's just out the long run aggregate supply curve. They've also done this because they wanted to have low exchange rates, because they wanted to have export-led growth. So one of the key features, which I've spoken about also in Lesson 55, is, is we want to have a low exchange rate policy reducing export prices so therefore we sell more exports and therefore we can increase aggregate demand. Now sadly this hasn't taken place yet. We haven't really had that great big leap forward but eventually it will happen. If the exchange rate keeps on falling and import prices keep on rising there will come a time when British customers will say we're not importing those goods anymore let's make them at home. That, that effect will occur at some time. Lastly, they've also used this process of quantitative easing. The banks were in so much trouble, and there was a lack of demand in the economy, and there was a, a big negative output up clearly in 2008. In fact, just as I'm speaking, the last couple of days, it's only in the last, literally, I think it was on, on th Thursday of this week, whereby our our actual GDP was higher than it was in 2008. So it's taken us six years to recover from, from that deficit. So one, th one of the things they did was, was to print more money. And in, in a sense, what they were doing was they were giving more liquidity to the banking system. Quite weird, really. The banking system had got us in trouble in the first place. However, we eventually bailed it out because obviously we need a banking system because the banks play a very important function in society where we go and put our money into the banks, we save our money, and then they lend it out to businesses. Okay, so overall then, these are some of the factors. There are, there are hundreds of factors really that the, bank, that the Bank of England takes into account when setting interest rates, but these are probably some of the bigger ones.
They'll also look at, for instance, is there a recession in the Eurozone? If there is a recession in the Eurozone, then there's going to be less demand for UK exports. Therefore, there'll be less aggregate demand. How successful has the Bank of England been? Well, OK, let's not be too hard on them, but I think they were pretty unsuccessful during the period 1997 to 2007. It's easy to say with hindsight, although I did run a campaign during that time, to say that I thought it was out of control. Right, the animal instincts had, had, gone, had gone crazy. The bankers were playing the piano. Why stop playing the piano? Why stop playing the piano when, uh, when, uh, when, when, forget all that. I'm going to cut that bit out. So uh, the uh, banking system was, was, was actually going pretty, was, was going pretty nuts and they didn't do anything about it. And on here, we've got the Monetary Policy Committee since then, since 2008. I think they've done pretty well because I think in 2008, when GDP fell by 5%, I think the economy was in a right mess. And I happen to believe that if they haven't adopted these radical procedures, that would be in an even bigger mess. However, ultimately, an economy always su survives because of its strong supply side policies and its innovation and its technology and its investment. And you can only do so much with monetary policy. But hey, presto, congratulations, Bank of England. You've done a good job since 2000. I'm still on lesson 55, which is all about monetary policy. And on this one is, are high interest rates the best way of solving inflation? Right, well, first of all, we've got to think of what sort of inflation we have. And you might want to start the essay by saying, OK, we have demand pull inflation, demand pull, and we also have cost push. And you may like to talk through those concepts. Now, quite clearly, actually, with demand pull inflation, probably the best way of bringing down demand pull inflation is through high interest rates. That's one way of doing it. But actually, high interest rates will also, and people often forget this, high interest rates will also actually bring down cost push via the high exchange rate, which I'm going to come to in a second or two. But ultimately, you may just want to use supply side economics because what happens is when we use supply side, right, and if I'm just going to quit, very quickly draw now a positive output gap, I'm not going to label all the different axes on here, but this is the AS curve on here. So right now we have aggregate demand all the way up here. OK, so we are we are we have got high inflation. So in this case, if we use supply side economics, right, OK, then quite clearly we're not going to get inflation. We're going to have the added advantage that we're going to move from NY to NY dash. OK, so that's seemingly the answer. However, as every AS or A2 student knows, is supply side takes a long time to work its way through the economy. So it's not always that, pos that possible to do that. So in the short run, getting rid of demand pull inflation, the most effective way certainly is through high interest rates. But ultimately, as regards any policy you ever have, you also want to have a good supply side policy. Now, if you read most newspaper articles, say in the Telegraph, Jeremy Warner or Alistair Heath, they always end up by saying, well, ultimately, the success of the economy will depend upon your supply side economics. And the previous session, I was just talking about printing money and what a good policy it was and how it saved our economy, etc. Right. Printing money is fine. It's OK. And it sort of works. However, you must have the right institutional factors you must have the right supply side policies to make it work. OK, so this is actually a really nice essay to have. Are high interest rates the best way of solving inflation? So basically, you just want to explain how, how, how high interest rates do, in fact, solve inflation. So obviously, we've got too much demand in the economy. We've got a positive output gap. So that will make sure that consumption falls down. Why? Because it's more expensive to borrow money. Investment will also fall. Why? Because it's more expensive to borrow money, but we don't we, we but we don't want investment to fall because investment will affect the affect the AS curve. Uh, it will also make the exchange rate go up because hot money will come into the UK. So therefore, the exchange rate is determined by the demand and supply of sterling. So therefore, the demand for sterling goes up. 
So therefore, we will expect the UK exchange rate to also go up, right? The exchange rate will also go up. And finally, of course, house prices is the fourth part of the transmission mechanism. And what's going to happen is it's going to be more expensive to buy a house. And as it's more expensive to buy a house in terms of borrowing money, so borrowing money becomes more expensive, therefore the demand for housing will fall and therefore the price of housing will therefore fall. Okay, so that will have a big imp impact on people's wealth, so therefore they'll spend less money. So therefore high interest rates will reduce aggregate demand in the economy quickly, which is what we want. Great. High interest rates may also lead to high exchange rates. Now what happens then is export prices rise. So that's going to make it harder for our exporters to sell their goods. So therefore it may force them to cut costs. So it may force them to become more efficient. But the other thing is, so export prices rise, is that import prices will fall. So automatically, straight away, if import prices fall, then cost push inflation is going to go down. So high interest rates will tackle demand pull and cost push. However, you're a pretty bad economist if you end up with a positive output gap, right? That shouldn't happen. But are high interest the best way of solving inflation? Maybe a good way of solving inflation, but right now we want to have in the UK economy in the year 2014, we want to have low interest rates and we want to have low interest rates because we want to increase investment. We also want to have low interest rates because we want a low exchange rate and we want to sell more exports. So there is a conflict there in the policy, right? That is why we've had interest rates of 0.5% for five years. And that's why Mark Carney, who's, pretty, who's a pretty radical economist, I think, a pretty radical governor of the Bank of England, has come over all the way from Canada. And he's saying that we're probably going to have low interest rates for a long period of time. In fact, they'll probably rise up in about three months' time. But even so, they've been low for a long period of time. Ultimately, of course, the best way of solving demand pull and cost push is to increase the AS curve. Because if we increase the AS curve, there's going to be less, there's going to be less of a positive output gap, number one. And number two, if we become more efficient, we can, or we increase our productivity, therefore we can reduce our costs, and therefore we will then go out and we will reduce cost push inflation. Thank you. You've come across the uh, last topic of monetary policy. Now, if we're just going to revise this again, monetary policy, which is run by the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England, the current governor of the Bank of England is Mark Carney. Traditionally, inflation has always been their main objective. So number one thing, you control inflation, you get price stability, therefore, therefore you get confidence. If you have more confidence, Therefore, you're going to get more investment and everything's going to work pretty well within the economy. So, OK, at this moment in time is to what extent are low interest rates appropriate at a time of high inflation? So this was an A2 question. Now, the first thing you want to decide about is, OK, what sort of inflation have we got? Have we got demand pull inflation or have we got cost push inflation? Because if we have demand pull inflation, which is a positive output gap, then really you should be thinking about having a, a high interest rate. So if on here, we've got this situation here, this is the AS curve, and we have demand pull inflation, inflation is far too high, you have high interest rates, and as I explained in the previous lesson, consumption will fall, investment will fall, because it's more expensive to borrow money, house prices may start to fall and everything else. So if it's demand pull inflation, it's not appropriate to have low interest rates. Unless, of course, you have a very strong fiscal policy where you've got high taxes, but governments don't like having high taxes. So if you have high income tax, then obviously that will help to reduce demand. But as I just previously said, governments do not like doing that policy. They like to control demand through interest rates. They don't like to have higher taxes because they will lose the election. Personally, I think that was one of the biggest mistakes they made during the nice decade, 1997, 2007. Because if you constructed policy with hindsight, they would have had higher taxes, which would have brought in more revenue because there's a boom going on, which would have calmed down the whole 
positive output gap, buying loads of imports, house prices booming, etc. It would have reduced all that and it would have brought loads of revenue in for the government, which would have been pretty useful. However, if it's cost push inflation, using high interest rates will bring down inflation because what will happen is high interest rates will increase the exchange rate, that will, will reduce import prices, and so that will also reduce cost push inflation. But it's it's a big it's a big policy to have just to reduce cost push. The other thing about low interest rates, of course, is that they also bring investment. So AES and AJ candidates love this. Of course, if you get more investment, then they love drawing the, they love drawing this diagram here. Then that's going to shift out the long run aggregate supply curve. So that's really, really good. And if we draw a demand curve on there, we can clearly see that more investments has actually reduced inflation. However, Will there be more investment if there is lots of inflation around? That's another question. So low interest rates can actually bring down inflation if there is more investment. Low interest rates will also add to inflation because a low interest rate will lead to a low exchange rate. A low exchange rate will lead to cost push inflation because of higher import prices. Low interest rates will also increase consumption, which will also increase investment, multiply accelerator, and we can still end up with demand pull inflation. So, okay, low interest rates are not really appropriate at a time of high inflation. If it is demand pull, then we're probably going to want to increase interest rates. However, if it's cost push inflation and it's coming from abroad, right, then there isn't really that much we can do about it apart from raising the exchange rate. But we don't want to do that because right now we're desperate in our economy to increase exports. So there is a conflict there within our policy. Ultimately, of course, like any other policy, probably the best way of reducing inflation is through supply side economics. Right. Particularly right now when maybe inflation isn't the main objective anymore. Maybe we want growth because inflation will also bring down in real terms, it will bring down the national debt, which is pretty important. And right now it's growth. We must get growth because we must get more tax returns to pay off the national debt. Otherwise, we couldn't end up with a sovereign debt crisis whereby the country goes bust. However, as regards A-level economics, what you want to do is get a good grade in the exam is tackle it from the, from the viewpoint of demand pull inflation, cost push inflation, high interest rates are very good at bringing down demand pull. They will also bring down cost push. However, low interest rates will increase investment, which will bring down inflation. We want to increase exports. And maybe at the end you're doing pretty well if you're going to say, well, actually, is inflation the main objective right now? Maybe it's growth. And actually, the best way of reducing inflation is supply side. But supply side is going to take a long, it's going to take a long time to work its way through the economy. Now, that is a pretty full report I've given on monetary policy on Lesson 55. So, so far on this course, we've done supply side policy, Lesson 52. We've done monetary policy, lesson 55, and next in line is fiscal policy, in brief, for lesson 56. Okay.